Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Real quick, before we jump into everything, we know that some of you have been having some issues with the Apple Podcast subscriptions. One, of the, they've been playing ads, and two, some of the bonus episodes haven't been playing. We've reached out to Apple. They're fixing it. So hopefully this is the last time that I have to bring this up. Also, if it's like there's ads, maybe just wait a little bit and see if it just needs some time to catch up after we've uploaded. Mm -hmm. But everything should be good now. And then as far as bonus content, we have a new Patreon episode dropping in two weeks. Next week. Next it should week. Be, yeah. Okay, great. Cool. All right. Are you ready for your 10 seconds? I think I am. So Peyton, well, we've been in California all week. Um, we're kind of hanging out here, as you can tell by the different studio setup. Everything's been going good. Just hanging out with family. I did have my pickleball tournament. It was fun, oh, huh? Yeah. No, it was, it was so fun. It went really good. Well, I thought it went good. Um, I thought it played good. You did. You played so good. Either way, it was super fun. We had a good time. So um, it's been so hot. I mean, I think it's been hot everywhere in the West, though. Mm -hmm. But other than that, just pickleball, California, family, and anything else? We went to the Kendrick Lamar concert last night. That's right. So we did go to the Kendrick Lamar concert last night. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it was so good. And I, I mean, I know a lot of his songs. I'm not like a diehard Kendrick fan though. Um, and it was one of the best concerts we've ever been to. No, it was super fun. It, we weren't, we knew we wanted to go, but I don't think we expected it to be that good. We both got kind of tired last night. We're like, should we go? So we're like, we have to go. Yeah. And it was really good. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Our case sources are caselaw.finelaw.com, cbsnews.com, localtoday.news, themarshallproject.org, nevadadailymail.com, mercurynews.com, arkansasonline.com, BuzzFeed, Missouri Net, Find a Grave, The Cinemaholic, and Murderpedia. All right, Gare, so do you remember a couple episodes ago when we discussed how it almost seems that the scariest murders happen out in the middle of nowhere? Yes, I do. How theoretically the less amount of people around you should help eliminate the fear of being attacked, but for some reason it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The fact that sleeping out in the middle of nowhere away from humans should seem safe, but is actually really scary because we've seen so many gruesome, frightening murders happen in places like that yep almost like being so cut off from society creates some reclusive scary humans who then go on to hurt people in wicked ways so today we are covering a case that entails just that what happens when you live so deep in the woods that bad people have the privacy and time to do whatever they want to you because no one can hear your screams okay great great <laughs> So our episode this week begins on February 1st, 1998 in rural Missouri. It's a small area called Vichy, Missouri, which is an unincorporated area in central Missouri. Today, the current population of Vichy is 946 people. Okay. So you can imagine how rural and small we were talking about back in 1998. Uh -huh. Vichy rests about 40 miles southeast of Jefferson City, Missouri, and the homes in the area lay at least a half mile to miles away from each other and are very secluded with large trees surrounding them. And on this evening in February of 1998, 36-year-old Susan Bruick and her two children, 12-year-old daughter Adrian and 9-year-old son Kyle were planning on going to Susan's sister's house for Sunday dinner. They never showed up. Dinner time came and went without word from the Bruicks on why they didn't show, and Susan's sister, Kay Hayes, found it odd. It wasn't like Susan to miss Sunday dinner, let alone just not show up without calling and explaining why. So Susan Bruick was born on October 23rd, 1961, to Winifred and Joseph in their very small city of Roya, Missouri. Susan grew up in a large family with three sisters and two brothers. Her siblings were Michael, Marvin, Kay, her sister who hosted Sunday dinner that mm -hmm. Susan had missed, and Joy and Barb. Susan lived in the rural area of Vichy, Missouri for her entire life. She attended Bell High School where she excelled as an honor student and was involved with the school choir and band. She served as vice president of her high school class and was a candidate for the honor of May Day Queen. After high school, Susan eventually married a man named Christopher. On March 12, 1985, Susan had her first child and daughter, Adrienne Bruick. 
Adrian was born in Roya, Missouri, because again, this is where everyone in Vichy had to go to find civilization, yeah. a hospital. At the time of our case, Adrian was a student in the seventh grade at St. James Junior High School. Adrian had hopes of becoming a teacher or a veterinarian someday. She was active with volleyball and, like her mom, was in band and choir. So I'm trying to think of the high school. Was there like a hundred kids at the high school? Yeah. So you actually had to drive to the nearest city, which was Roya, to go to a high school, to go to a hospital, to go basically anywhere. Okay. So after Adrian, on September 17th, 1988, Kyle Christopher Brooke was born in Roya. He was a third grade student at Lucy Wortham James Elementary School in St. James during our story. Kyle had hopes of becoming an army officer someday. He enjoyed playing soccer and was a good student. After having both kids, Susan and Christopher divorced, which resulted in Susan raising both Adrian and Kyle on her own as a single mom. This ended up being great, though, because Susan's life reportedly revolved around her children. There was actually no information as to whether Christopher was involved in helping to raise the children after the divorce or whether he shared custody of the children with Susan. I haven't seen any reference to him doing that, but I can't say for sure that he didn't have a part in their life either. Mm -hmm. But at the time of our story, Susan and her two children were living in home in rural Vichy, and she was employed and working at an electronics plant where she worked in the production department. Two days after Susan and her children missed that family dinner in February of 1998, Kay's concern, her sister, grew when she still hadn't heard anything from Susan. She called the home number but got no answer. She then called one of their sisters, Joy, to see if she'd heard from Susan, but Joy hadn't heard from her either. On the evening of Wednesday, February 4th, 1998, Kay, Joy, and other family members, along with a friend, went to Susan's home to go check on her and the children. They quickly discovered that Susan and her two kids weren't home and that their Bronco, their family car, wasn't there. The family members went inside the house and their fear grew stronger when they discovered Susan, Adrian, and Kyle's winter coats inside the house, which didn't make any sense because it was February in Missouri, so it's bitterly cold outside. Like, they wouldn't go Mm -hmm. anywhere without their coats. Just as concerning, it was plain that a robbery had taken place in the home. The family members could see that the TV and the VCR were missing. There were a bunch of valuables missing from the home. So the family members, of course, called the police. The police came out to Susan's home that night where they secured and searched the scene. An officer from the Missouri State Highway Patrol, who would be heavily involved in investigating the case named Ralph, found Susan's prescription glasses in Adrian's room. Now, the family members told police that Susan would never leave the house without her glasses. She couldn't see without them. So this was even more alarming. Okay. Based on the circumstances, it appeared to everyone that the three were possibly kidnapped and then forced to go somewhere in their own car because it looks like they left unwillingly. The police started asking questions about who would want to do such a thing, and they also asked for information about Susan's ex-husband, Christopher. Apparently, the two didn't have a very harmonious relationship, and as we know, the husband or the ex-husband is always the first suspect. Surprisingly, I couldn't find much information about the investigation into Christopher other than the fact that he was cleared of any involvement in the disappearance, which leads me to believe that he must have had a pretty strong alibi Mm -hmm. for this time. While tracking down the ex-husband, police were also making their way to neighbors' homes to see if they might have seen or heard anything. It was a fat chance since the closest neighbor was almost still a half mile away and the area was dense, but maybe they noticed a strange car or something happening. Police made their way to the door and ended up speaking to a man named David Bolin. Now, David told police he hadn't heard or seen anything strange, and he really didn't know Susan or her children. Police asked him if anyone else lived with him in the house who they could talk to. Maybe someone else had seen something. It seems strange that he didn't know them. No, because the, I mean, the houses are at least a half mile apart. I mean, still, I guess if you're neighbors, right? At some point, it's... Right, but this is also a rural area. Uh-huh. I mean, when when I was researching the area and everything, it doesn't seem like a very, oh, everyone has a farm and everyone's super friendly. Yeah, it yeah. seemed like, oh, everyone is out here so they don't have to be in civilization. So it, I'm not that surprised that he's yeah. like, I don't even really know them. I mean, I guess there's still neighbors we don't even know that live next to us. True. <laughs> that are a couple feet. <laughs> right. So David Boland told police, yeah, actually my two nephews live with me. 18-year-old Mark Christensen and 17-year-old Jesse Carter. 
but the teenage cousins would not be able to talk to police. And police are like, okay, why can't we talk to the boys? Mm -hmm. They couldn't talk to police because David Bolin hadn't seen them in three days and the uncle didn't know where they were. Okay. In fact, the last time he had seen his teenage nephews was Sunday morning, the same day that Susan and her children missed dinner with family. So when police realized that not only was Susan and her children missing, but also the neighbor boys as well, they were almost positive the two were connected. Mm -hmm. In this extremely small and rural area, it just so happens that two neighboring homes had residents who were missing. So police began conducting interviews to try and figure out how Susan, Adrian, and Kyle's lives tied into Mark and Jesse's beyond just being neighbors. Yeah. And I will now be referring to Mark and Jesse as their last names, which is Christensen and Carter. So the real history and story between the neighbors started back in January that year. This is what police would learn. It was one month prior to Susan and her children going missing. Okay. Apparently, trouble developed between Mark Christensen and Susan Bruick sometime in January 1998. It all started when Susan reached out to Christensen to make a request. She asked him to please not hunt on her property anymore. Okay. Her reasoning? Young Kyle, her son, enjoyed the outdoors and did a lot of outside roaming and play. I mean, very typical. Susan knew it wasn't safe for Kyle to play outside on their property if Christensen and Carter were shooting guns and hunting nearby. There could easily be an accident. So this is a completely sane and normal request of her. Stay on your property so my kids can freely and safely roam on our property. Mm -hmm. But Christensen took offense to the fact that Susan asked them not to hunt on her property, given that young Kyle played outside. Susan was now considered an enemy to a very unstable and reckless teenage Mark Christensen. Weird. Christensen thought Susan Broick, quote, was a B word because she made him get off her property a couple of times. So this is what he was telling people. He he definitely had beef with her just because of this. Uh-huh. And even though trouble was brewing between the neighbors, tension was also rising at home between Uncle Bolin and the two boys. On February 13th, 2004, Christensen and Carter were unhappy living at Brolin's home because he listened in on their phone calls and also expected them to work on the property. Like, keep up their end of the bargain. And I'm just sitting here going, oh, poor boys. Yeah, yeah. How frustrating to be expected to pull your own weight exactly. at home. But it seems to me, I mean, the sources didn't really cover this, but after researching the case for as long as I did, it seems like the boys were very entitled. Um, they had a lot of alone time. It was too boys who were living with their uncles their home lives had been bad so now they ended up at their uncle's house it just feels like i'm not that surprised that they're like i can't believe i have to pull my weight at home so as police were digesting the tumultuous past of the boys and their troubled relationship with susan they were also now conducting searches for her and her children searching on foot scanning the house and surrounding areas for any clues By February 5th, 1998, just a day after the family had been reported missing, the Missouri State Highway Patrol used a helicopter to search the area for the missing family and their car. It was during this helicopter ride that officers conducting the aerial search noticed something floating in a pond not far away, only a half mile southeast of Susan's home. The police landed the helicopter in a field near the pond to investigate. And there, they confirmed everyone's worst fears. According to localtoday.news, as the helicopter landed and the detective made his way to the pond, he spotted a 16-gauge shotgun. The pond had a thin layer of ice over the surface, and as the detective and his partner drew closer, they realized that what was floating in the icy pond was a human body. According to the detective, the body was floating on its back, the head out of the water, and part of the shoulders out of the water as well. When they found the body, they found it to be a white woman in her 30s or 40s. She had neither shoes nor a coat on. She also had a large cut across her neck. 
After pulling what the detective thought was missing Susan out of the water, he also saw what appeared to be two shadow figures out further in the oh my pond. Gosh. The detective goes to the pond and breaks the ice near the shadows, pulling out two corpses. The other two bodies were determined to be Susan's children, Adrian and Kyle. How old were the boys again? The neighbor boys, uh-huh. 17 and, and 18. Okay, so super young. Yeah, super young. So missing Susan and her two children have just been found basically a half mile away from their home floating in a pond murdered. The medical examiner performed autopsies on the three bodies. The results were as follows. Susan's death was determined to be from drowning. The cuts on her neck weren't Mm. severe enough to cause immediate death. The ME, though, found that Susan had suffered bleeding under her scalp, which was the result of a blow to her head. According to the autopsy, the injuries to her neck would have been fatal injuries. She would have died from the blood loss within an hour of the injuries, but she had drowned before that happened. So essentially, she had been cut her neck had been cut open but she had been drowned before she died from blood loss adrian's death was from suffocation the autopsy also revealed that adrian had suffered a puncture wound on her arm that was consistent with having been hit by a shotgun shell so almost like someone had tried to shoot her but had missed and it had just grazed her arm instead although the emmy didn't find any actual bullets in her arm Kyle's death, like his mom's, was from drowning. He also had been bleeding under his scalp. The Emmy found two superficial cuts across Kyle's neck. One was a two and a half inch cut and the other was a three and a half inch cut. So both Kyle and his mom had had their necks slashed and then they were drowned. Jeez. The full police investigation began after this. The police searched the area around the pond. There they found various key pieces of evidence, including a shotgun shell from a 16-gauge shotgun, some shoe prints, and the presence of blood splattered around on dirt and leaves by the pond. So they essentially figure out this is the crime scene. Like the whole family was beaten and attacked here and then drowned and then pushed out into the pond. And can they tell if it was done by one or two people yet they they have no idea but the boys are still missing at this point the police also found two cinder blocks on the bank of the pond near where the bodies were found what what did the cinder blocks have to do with anything well they were most likely used to weigh down the bodies in the pond but Uh it was too hard to get them attached to the bodies they ended up just pushing the bodies out significantly the police found tire tracks which they were able to track The tire tracks from the scene where the bodies were found led all the way back to David Brolin's property, the closest neighbor of Susan, Adrian, and Kyle, and the home where disgruntled Christensen and Carter lived before disappearing the same day Susan and her children were last seen. So to everyone around, it seemed like Christensen and Carter most likely had something to do with the deaths of Susan, Adrian, and Kyle. And they were now on the run in none other than Susan's own missing Bronco because of Mm -hmm. her car's missing and the boys are missing one plus one equals two. Because of this, the two teenagers were charged with the murders despite the fact that they weren't in police custody. Weird. So after police find Susan and her children's murdered bodies, they decide to charge the missing neighbor boys with the murders, even though all they basically have is the fact that they're missing. They were disgruntled with Susan and now the bodies are found. seems weird they're charging them already considering there's no um, DNA evidence. Right. Just because I don't think they'll get convicted. I mean, I think the strongest piece of evidence they have is that the tire tracks lead back to their house and essentially draw or tying both the house to the crime scene. Yeah. Within two days of finding the bodies, there were arrest warrants issued for the murders, and it seemed like the murderers were gone in the wind. On February 9th, 1998, law enforcement circulated wanted flyers with the boys' photos. A Riverside County Sheriff's Department detective recognized the fugitives all the way in Blythe, California. So they had driven from Missouri to California. Uh The police arrested Christensen and Carter later that day. Upon arrest, Mark Christensen, the older of the two, stayed tight-lipped and claimed innocence. He wasn't talking. He's like, I'm not talking to anyone. Give me a lawyer. I have nothing to do with this. But Jesse Carter, the younger, the younger cousin, sang like a bird after victim Adrian's stolen fishing pole was found in the back of Susan's stolen Bronco that Jesse and Mark were driving. Okay. According to Jesse Carter... 
After becoming upset at their neighbor and their home life and feeling entitled and full of themselves, Christensen and Carter devised a plan that would solve all of their problems. They just sound like complete tool bags. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, though. I mean, here's the thing. We've seen brothers who kill before, and uh -huh. there's always this inflated sense of ego, a lot of alone time, a lot of... Uh, I, I, like just entitlement. And uh -huh. that's exactly what I'm filling out of these guys. I mean, just from the beginning, oh, well, I have to work on the farm. Oh my gosh, my life's so hard, right? Everything from the beginning just sounds yeah. like, I don't know, welcome to life. R literally. So on Saturday, January 31st, 1998, Christensen and Carter came up with a plan to run away from home where they lived with David Roland, their yeah. uncle. The next day, they were going to rape Susan to get back at her for kicking them off her property they were then going to steal her bronco and drive it to california where they would start over and finally live life not tied down by their uncle and not living near their awful neighbor which seems so ironic like what were they gonna do for work they this did, is they, what i'm they, saying they didn't, they didn't like think that far yeah they couldn't even think that far uh-huh Although this is a much shorter prep time than we normally see with teenage familial killers, yeah. the next day, Christensen and Carter executed their plan. It was Sunday, February 1st, so 1998, and they waited for their uncle to leave for work. Once he was gone, they grabbed two shotguns, knives, rope, extra shoelaces, and gloves, and then headed on foot the short distance to Susan's home. I was like, what does killing them have to do with their plan right so like why not just take the car and leave so you have to keep in mind this is the confession that jesse carter is giving police right this is coming from his to his testimony basically because yep. mark has decided to lawyer up and he's like no no no. the whole plan was just to rape her but it seems to me that although that's what they claim their plan was they sure did create a pretty solid and scary kill kit to bring with them i mean they I just said they brought two shotguns, knives, rope, extra shoelaces, gloves. So I'm like, if you were really going mm -hmm. over there just to uh, conduct a sexual assault, why are you bringing all this stuff to kill yeah, them? Yeah, no way. Also, I think it's weird that one of them lawyered up and the other one didn't. Again, pretty common in a in a killing duo where one is a submissive and one is a dominant you just think they would have talked about it before like, i'm sure hey, they if did. we get caught let's both lawyer up and then right. one does and one doesn't oh i don't think they're that smart yeah apparently not. i just think the older of the two um was kind of the ringleader and uh -huh. so he was like no 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 i'm i'm gonna lawyer up but the younger was probably the more submissive in this situation which is also interesting because he he will probably get a plea deal because he's saying all this information granted we don't know what the truth is yet so right right so christensen and carter according to carter's testimony arrive at susan's house and they hide outside the home for a few minutes before breaking in keep in mind this is like in the middle of the day yeah, like yeah. it's daylight outside and all three members of the Brook family are inside, Susan and her two children. One source said that they went in the front door, so it's not clear whether it was locked or not, but they certainly didn't have permission to enter into the home, and they most likely caught Susan and her children off guard. The crime initially did start as more of a home invasion robbery. Uh -huh. um, and trigger warning, we are going to go into detail about the time that the boys spent in the house, and so it could be triggering to some listeners, so feel free to skip ahead if you don't need to hear this part christensen and carter bust in through the door and they found adrian and kyle in the living room sitting on the floor carter got busy tying up the children's hands with the shoelaces that they brought their mom susan had been in the kitchen but then she came into the living room likely running in when she heard the commotion That's so insane Christensen pointed his shotgun at Susan and then forced her at gunpoint into her daughter's room. Allegedly, following the initial plan, Christensen sexually assaulted Susan on Adrian's bed. Okay. Christensen then brought Susan back into the living room where Carter used some yellow rope they'd brought with them to tie Susan's hands behind her back. And again, none of the sources listed who's the dominant and who's the submissive. But the older of the two, Christensen, he took the mom, he conducted the sexual assault while Carter stood watch. Like Correct. he was just being the watchman. He uh -huh. was just tying. So to me, that's kind of why I'm getting this vibe. Yeah. After Susan and her children are all tied up in the living room, Susan says to the neighbor boys, you had your fun. Now get out. 
During this whole thing, Susan and her children had resisted and fought back, so it did not go without beating and injury. Mm. Both Susan and nine-year-old Kyle had wounds bleeding from their heads because they had been hit on the head. They're so young. There's just nothing they can do. Nothing they can do. It's so messed up. It was around this point in the attack that 12-year-old Adrian recognized Jesse Carter as one of the attackers. Mm. She called him by his name. And Christensen and Carter panicked. Now, I found no source that mentioned the boys were masked or disguised. So I'm not sure how they didn't expect to be recognized. So I'm going to assume they were masked up, but also maybe they really didn't know each other well enough. But wouldn't Susan recognize them if she had asked them to get off their property? So I'm assuming we're just missing some evidence here. And they were, they had tried to disguise themselves. And also there's a slight chance that the boys just said they weren't originally planning on hurting the family and use the lame excuse of being recognized Uh, as their way to justify what they did. That's true. Yeah. So there's a chance that they were always going in planning to murder, didn't, didn't disguise themselves because they knew they were going to kill them. But then once they got caught, we're like, no, 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 we weren't going to kill them. But then they recognized us. So I'm still not a hundred percent convinced that they didn't go into the tack knowing full well what they were about to do. Like I'm, I'm not a hundred percent convinced, even though that's what they are claiming. With all the supplies they have, there's, I mean, in, in my opinion, there's no questions. I agree. No questions asked. So Christensen and Carter, according to Carter, then forced the three terrified family members into the back seat of the family's vehicle, the 1984 Ford Bronco. They also loaded the Bronco with various items they stole from Susan's home, including electronics such as a TV, a VCR, a car stereo, a video game player, along with Susan's checkbook, some music CDs, and Adrian's fishing pole. Christensen drove the five of them in the Bronco a short distance along a rural highway and then down an unpaved gravel road and across a neighbor's field. He stopped the Bronco at a pond near the edge of some woods. Christensen and Carter forced Susan and Adrian and Kyle out of the car and to the edge of the water. There, they then committed their brutal murders. The details are truly horrific, and I'm not going to get all the way into them because it's it's just more heartbreaking than helpful to the story. That's another thing as well. I I think if maybe you don't plan on killing someone, maybe they just shoot them and they right. leave. But considering how I gruesome. mean we haven't gone into all the details, but considering how gruesome it sounds like, I mean, this was a hundred percent premeditated. I agree. A hundred and ten percent. I agree. I think that they just use the whole, oh well, we weren't planning on killing, but try to get a lesser yeah, it's a awful, lesser charge. Awful. So Susan's throat was cut near the water and after the and after that the kids were gruesomely murdered. All three of them were pushed into the pond with weights on them. Um, But again, some of the weights weren't attached to them because they were found at the, the, they were found not in the water. Did both of the brothers have part in the murders? Do you know? We don't know. Okay. We don't know. They never clarified who did what, but I mean, you still have three. Yeah. Um, None of it was quick or painless and there were multiple attempts at killing all of them because again as we've learned my gosh it's not as easy to kill someone as someone would think Uh and so they had to try multiple methods which we've seen with young teenage killers uh killers who are obsessed with killing but don't actually realize how hard it is to murder someone but then for the victim this is just 10 times more painful because you know you cut someone's throat and then they don't immediately die. So then you keep doing more and more and more to try to kill them. So I'm not going to detail, but that is exactly what happened yeah. here. And I will dare say that one of the cruelest things you could do is cut a mother's throat and then make her watch as you brutally murder her children yeah. as she's bleeding I out. I, I mean, it's I just can't. awful. Yeah. So Christensen and Carter then drove the Bronco back to the home they lived in with Brolin. They left the vehicle near a pile of garbage on their property, presumably to keep it hidden until they could get away. They ran into the house where they grabbed their clothes, their belongings. They loaded it into a different car, an Oldsmobile. They drove the Oldsmobile to where they'd left the Bronco near the garbage pile and moved all of their stuff from the Oldsmobile to the Bronco. Okay. They then used the Bronco to flee the area. A relative actually saw them doing this and ran after them on foot but christensen and carter drove away so it's just kind of like okay i guess they didn't want to talk i can't believe that they found them in california it's not like it was 2020 i know it was 1998 granted i mean everything was i mean we weren't like in the 50s or 40s but still to be like for a cop to recognize mm-hmm. oh wait that's them that's the, that that's the fugitives on yeah. a state that's pretty far away from california right. and large and large that's impressive right 
So the boys headed west on Interstate 44 towards California, selling the items they had stolen from Susan's home along the way. They stopped at pawn shops and even sold the 16-gauge shotgun they'd used during the murders. Okay. They were actually pulled over twice in the Bronco in California before the bodies were found. So the Bronco hadn't been reported stolen yet. So they were just ticketed and released. Like the two boys were pulled over after they committed these murders. But because police hadn't like discovered everything yet, they were just let go. And that evening, Susan and Adrian and Kyle were supposed to go for Sunday dinner after all of this um, at Kay Hayes' home, but they never showed as we know. After being arrested in California, the two fugitives were sent back to Missouri to face murder charges and were held at Cole County Jail in the bigger city of Jefferson City, Missouri. The police questioned both boys, and as we know, Jesse Carter confessed to his involvement in the crimes while Mark Christensen lawyered up. Semen that was found inside of Susan's body and on Adrian's sheets was tested for DNA, and the DNA was determined to be a match with Christensen, so they now had forensic DNA. Uh The odds of such a match were 1 in 1.3. Three, two billion. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's a match. For sure. Law enforcement also determined conclusively that the 16-gauge shotgun that Christensen sold at a pawn shop in Texas was the firearm used to fire the shell that was found next to the pond where the bodies were found. So okay. again, tying them to the crime scene. This was great because not only did they have a confession, they also had forensic and circumstantial evidence to back everything up. The two defendants were tried in separate jury trials. Christensen went first in 1999. interesting. Carter's murder trial took place in 2000. Now, um, I actually looked this up, and one of the main reasons you would separate these trials Uh is because they're going to use Jesse Carter against Mark Christensen. He's going to testify against his cousin, even though they're both being charged which is why the trials are separate no yeah that makes sense at christensen's trial jesse carter did indeed testify against his cousin in exchange for the state not to seek the death penalty against him so mark christensen is going to the state's going to push for the death penalty but because jesse carter confessed and then testified against mark at trial he's not going to be put up for death penalty which is super interesting because there is a lot I guess Jesse could have done to get out of it, right? He could have lied. He could have said he didn't do any of the killing, but he didn't say any of that, I assume. No. Well, the other thing is, is just like the forensic evidence was so strong that he yep. was clearly there. I guess they just, they already assume he's a submissive. So, I, I mean, there's a, I don't know, there's a lot of routes. I'm glad he didn't, but there's just, there there's were a lot of routes, routes that he could have gone. Uh, yes, yes. Overall, Carter's testimony portrayed himself as the minor participant in the murder. So okay. even though he didn't say he didn't have a hand in it, but he, he said, you know, I didn't do the sexual assault. Mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, basically confirming that Christensen was the dominant and Carter was more of the submissive. Christensen testified in his own defense, which seems to be common for narcissistic killers yes. for them to be like, no, 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 I have to talk. I have to, I have to defend myself. His story was that Susan and him were having a consensual sexual relationship. Um, and that's why his semen was oh found inside gosh. of her. And he denied any involvement in the crime, what said, no, Carter did the whole thing, came back to the property, and I just ran away with him. No. Uh-huh. On September 1st, 1999, the jury convicted Mark Christensen of murder in the first degree as to all three victims. Good. The case then went on to the penalty phase, which is done in death penalty cases. Additional evidence was put on during the penalty phase, including evidence that Christensen had sexually assaulted another man in prison while awaiting trial. No so while way. waiting to go on trial, he sexually assaulted someone in prison. What is wrong with him? And this was brought forward for his penalty phase. Okay. Mark Christensen was then sentenced to death for the murders of Susan and her children. After Carter's trial, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Susan and her children. Okay. According to testimony at his trial, Christensen endured a difficult, abusive childhood sexually and physically. Again, I've already stated this. The boys didn't come. They didn't have very good home lives, which is how they even ended up with their uncle in the first place. This is never an excuse for the behavior, but this is something that his defense did bring up. His defense team also put in evidence that he had a low IQ, arguing that it affected his ability to understand his legal rights. This was an effort to try and avoid 
avoid the death penalty. Mm -hmm. They also claim that his IQ was only 74 and that he had severe cognitive disabilities. On January 31st, 2017, 19 years after the murders, Christensen's impending execution was set for 7 p.m. that night, wow. January 31st, okay. 2017. His recent attorney argued to the public that day, the day of his execution, that Mark was 18 at the time of the crime and had an IQ of 74. His execution may be unconstitutional, but the courts keep trying to rush him to the death chamber instead of giving him a fair opportunity in court. This is what his defense attorney says. so ironic, yeah. In response, the state attorney general um, argued that Christensen wasn't hampered by mental incapacity. As reported on KCUR.org, he argued Christensen was able to carry out normal everyday functions. He was able to respond to prison conduct violation allegations, identify a witness, request an attorney for a grievance, and provide his own version of events. So basically, uh, the state attorney general is like, no, 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 no. He was yeah, fine. Yeah. He's he's completely capable of making decisions. At 3.46 p.m., the day of his execution, the United States Supreme Court denied an additional state in the execution. So they're like, nope, we're not going to pause it. We're going forward. And newly elected Missouri governor declined Christensen's request for clemency. Um, he gave a statement that he thoughtfully considered the facts of the case and decided not to intervene in the execution. Wow. At 5.14 p.m., the execution process begins to be carried out at the state prison in Missouri. There is tight security around the prison at this point. According to the Missouri Department of Public Safety, 14 people were outside of the prison demonstrating against the death penalty. Interesting. So because he was being executed that day, demonstrators were there saying, you know, we don't agree with the death mm -hmm. penalty. At 7.05 p.m., eight minutes after the lethal injection was given, 37-year-old Mark Christensen is pronounced dead by the Missouri Department of Corrections. His brother and sister-in-law attended the execution in support of Christensen. And although it was it had been 19 years, 37 seemed so young to me. Like, shockingly yeah. young. Even though I knew he was 18 at the time of the murders. I also find it weird. I mean, to each their own. But that, like, you have family that comes. I mean, I get it. I guess you're dying, but... <laughs> I don't know. You killed, you brutally murdered three people. I understand. So I, I probably have a different opinion maybe than some other listeners, but that's my opinion. <laughs> you wouldn't go? No way. I would probably go. Like if, let's say Peyton kills three people. You wouldn't go? No, there's no way, dude. <laughs> well, okay, what, would you go to mine? Yeah. You're insane. Yeah, but Garrett and I, we, we fundamentally disagree on this topic. Yes. So we have two opposing opinions totally okay yep. like you know but it does give us a a, a different view when we listen 100%. to these cases so a statement was given um by adrian and kyle's half sister which this would be um their dad's daughter uh -huh. from a different marriage she says there's not a day that goes by that i do not miss them and i wish they were here she fought tears as she read a poem that adrian wrote in the sixth grade not long before she died called our love the poem is actually provided on the internet so to close i'm going to read the poem that adrian our victim wrote okay it goes our love will always be there even when fate is not fair sometimes our love may be lost but that's not always the ultimate cost love is when you meet the unique the one your heart is out to seek love is soaring to the sky but not everyone can tell you why love is when your heart has a voice what will happen is not your choice and i just wanted to kind of end with that a bit because she was going to die not soon after she wrote that poem, but for being so young and to, yeah. you know, already put those thoughts out there, I just thought was really, really beautiful. It's just so sad that, I mean, they didn't do anything wrong. They did nothing wrong whatsoever. They literally just said, please don't hunt on our yeah. land. And so they got killed because of it. Right. And this brings me into the psychology that we were talking about, where this is not the first time we've seen young brother or male relatives who plan to commit violent crimes together. It's insane. This story kind of draws eerie similarity to me. There's a case called the Beaver family who were all murdered by their brother. Uh -huh. It was 18 year old Robert Beaver and 16 year old Michael Beaver. So basically the Beaver children lived a very secluded life. They were homeschooled. They had a lot of alone time. 
Robert, the older one, ended up on the dark web, where he, in- which he introduced to Michael, his younger brother. Together, they became fascinated with the power and fame that comes from mass killing. They became obsessed with the Columbine shooting and familial side. Remember that the Columbine shooters were also very obsessed with power, fame, darkness. The Beaver brothers prepared and planned the murder of their family, going from their dad, who was 54, My all the gosh. way to their two-year-old That's sibling. Crazy. On July 22nd, 2015, police received a 911 call from one of the family members who told police his brothers were attacking the family. Screaming and commotion could be heard in the background of the call before the line went dead. And these two brothers literally just killed their whole family. Yeah. And it seems to me the connection between murderous siblings or family members kind of comes from a rougher home life, seclusion, a lot of alone time together, and at least one or both members having a heightened sense of self entitlement and obsession with power and fame. And it's like, it's pretty strange how common this type of murder happens. Mm -hmm. But that is the murders of Susan, Adrian, and Kyle. All right, you guys. So that is our case for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for supporting. Again, a reminder, a bonus Patreon episode will be here next week. And I guess we'll see you next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.